Warm greetings to you all, all over the world on this Feast of Tabernacles. Brethren, I have a question for you today. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Do you look on the bright side or on the negative side as a general rule? All of us have ups and downs. Sometimes we're more positive than others, but what is your general pattern of life, of your character, that of an optimist or that of a pessimist? You know, American President Ronald Reagan died two years ago, back in June of 2004, and I'm sure many of you in the United States and perhaps elsewhere as well saw at least some portions of the memorials given in his honor and the eulogies that were given that week when the whole nation was in mourning. There were some very remarkable things that came out of the eulogies. One of the things that struck me the most were the comments made by both friend and political foe about this man who so significantly changed the landscape of American politics. It wasn't about his policies, his acts, his administration so much. It was his optimism, his optimism. Former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher perhaps summed it up best in the opening sentence of her eulogy. She said, In his lifetime, Ronald Reagan was such a cheerful and invigorating presence that it was easy to forget what daunting historic tasks he set for himself. He sought to mend America's wounded spirit, to restore the strength of the free world, and to free the slaves of communism. Cheerful and invigorating presence. Without fail, the words on the lips of commentators was that President Ronald Reagan restored hope, vision, and optimism to the, to the United States. The author Francois Basile wrote about optimism and leadership when he said, What truly distinguishes a leader from others is the ability to communicate this vision in such a compelling way as to attract followers who become excited about the vision and committed to achieving it. Napoleon declared that, quote, the leader is a dealer in hope. A dealer in hope. Brethren, isn't that an interesting summation of the role of a leader? Continuing on, this author said, to deal in hope, you must be able to package it, describe it, and sell it to others so that it becomes theirs. Communication skills, therefore, are crucial to the effectiveness of leaders. Interesting, Mr. Armstrong understood this long ago. Through his vision, the church has always placed a high priority on speaking skills as part of leadership uh, through programs such as Spokesman's Club, and that's been going on for decades now and continues to go on, not just for the sake of speaking, but in order to learn to convey a message that we have in an exciting, compelling, and thought-provoking way. You can't really, in the long run, be an effective leader without being an effective communicator, especially in the work that we've been called to do. Going on, the author spoke of former President Reagan this way. He said, Reagan was not just a good communicator, but was called, in quote, the great communicator. And we know that that's what President Reagan was called. Reagan was also described as an eternal optimist. Eternal optimist. The ability to convey that optimism through communication These leaders recognized that was a shining quality in this American president. Brethren, how powerful is optimism in a leader? How important is the ability to communicate a vision in a positive and hopeful way? At the Feast of Tabernacles, how much are we learning to be optimists and to communicate a message of faith and hope? Is it your destiny to become an eternal optimist. President Reagan was called the eternal optimist, but look at what we're being called to. Look at what we are picturing, what we are observing these seven days, a real hope for mankind, the kingdom of God, and us having a chance to accept and transmit that hope to mankind. That's, of course, one of the reasons why we're here, isn't it? If you'd like a title for today's sermon... Mine is the eternal optimist, the eternal optimist. In this world, optimists are kind of rare, aren't they? And even sometimes the butt of jokes. Milton Berle, the comedian, once said, an optimist is a man who always sees the bright side of your problem. That's always easier to do, isn't it? 
Easy to be cheerful about other problems, a little bit harder to be cheerful about our own. Mark Twain once said, There is no sadder sight than, than a young pessimist except an old optimist. Someone else once said, A pessimist is an optimist with experience. Well, experience seems to oftentimes uh, dilute optimism over time. It's also said that teenage boys who have just learned to drive are true optimists. They believe the E on the gas gauge simply means enough as opposed to empty. Computer programmers are also optimists. One programmer defined optimism this way for all you computer programmers. It said this, an optimist, what a programmer is full of after fixing the last bug and just before actually discovering the next to the last bug. All programmers are optimists. Perhaps this modern field especially attracts those who believe in happy endings. Perhaps the hundreds of nitty frustrations drive away all but those who habitually focused on the end goal. Perhaps it is merely that computers are young, programmers are young, and the young are always optimists. But however the selection process works, the result is indisputable. This time it will surely run, or I just found the last bug. And anyone who works with computers, you understand that. It has some truth to it. You know, the world defines optimism as being somewhat naive, doesn't it? Not really knowing the score, not really have gone around the block enough. After all, if you're optimistic and cheerful about life, there's got to be something wrong, right? You really haven't lived. You're somewhat immature or childish or unrealistic. Well, if that's the way we look at it, maybe we have the wrong idea. Because God is an optimist. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever thought about that? Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, in this way, Jeremiah chapter 29 in verse 11. God is optimistic. He's hopeful. He looks to the positive. He can accomplish anything he wants. <clears throat> and of course, what he wants is the most hopeful and the most exciting plan that one could ever imagine. That, of course, is mankind becoming God. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God is optimistic about our chances of making it and succeeding. And that can make us pretty happy, can't it? That can make us optimistic. That can make us hopeful. He's not betting against us. <clears throat> His expected end is that we win. And isn't that really one of the messages of this Feast of Tabernacles? That in the end mankind will win with God's help. The Satan, the devil will be vanquished. Mankind will be able to respond to him and grow in a society that will be totally different. Verse 12, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart and I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. This is, of course, foretelling the story of national Israel coming back from slavery. The whole world really coming out of a time of war to peace. We know that's coming. The Feast of Trumpets points out the very dark time of gloominess and war and destruction. And yet the Feast of Tabernacles points to a time when all that will be over. <clears throat> we often talk about this at the Feast, don't we? That we will be there to teach people in the future. We will need to instruct them, to help them, to guide them, to teach them, to see the error of their former ways. We'll need to teach them about the law of cause and effect. We'll need to teach them how to teach their children. So these things will be passed on to the next generation. But what's the very first thing that they will need when we find people after the big Holocaust? After their captivity, after their enslavement. Imagine what their state will be. Will it be a long doctrinal discourse that will help them the most? 
Will it be a lot of technical and logical arguments? Will we first off explain first, second, and third tithe? Those sorts of things? Well, why not? Because they will have been shell-shocked. They will have been through war. They will have lost, many of them, their loved ones. They will have seen their children ripped out of their arms. They will have gone without food and water. They will have lived in fear for their lives every day. That's what prophecy tells us. So what do they need at that time? Well, they need food. They need water. They need shelter. But perhaps most of all, they need someone to tell them that everything is going to be okay. They will need hope. And you and I are training to be dealers in hope. That's what these days are all about. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 8. Notice Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 8. Are you filled with hope? And my field filled with hope? Are we optimistic about our lives, about the future? Is that part of our character, part of our makeup. Yes, we all have ups and downs. Yes, there are times when we all have trials. But is optimism and hope for the future something that pervades us, something that fills us, something that comes out because it's in us through God? That's what we're training for. Jeremiah 31, verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, The woman with child and her that travails with child together, a great company shall return there. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. You notice how are they coming at the beginning of the millennium, at the end of their captivity. We know the prophecy. It'll be the worst time of trouble of all history. People will come weeping and mourning, hurt and down with trials and difficulties, unspeakable, unfathomable, hard for us even to imagine. The worst time of all human history. The scripture says how they will be led back home with supplications. That word supplications is interesting. It comes from the Strong's word 8469, which comes from a root word kanan, C-H-A-N-A-N, This root word means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. Supplications. Bending down to help someone in need. A superior, someone who has charge of this person, leaning down to assist someone under their care. Lending an ear, providing a shoulder, a hand to help them up and help them on their way, perhaps, back from captivity. That will be very real at that time, won't it? The word kanan, C-H-A-N-A-N, goes on to mean to favor, to bestow, to implore, i.e. to move to favor by petition. In other words, this is the picture of a superior, someone who has charge over others, bending down to help someone they serve by imploring them. Now, what does imploring mean? Imploring means to beseech, to plead, to entreat, to beg. Do you see the picture? The saints who are resurrected in God's kingdom, helping people in the beginning of the millennium, will be entreating, will be gently pleading with people to follow us, to follow them. They won't know who to trust. You think about what they've gone through. They won't know whom they can look to. Their lives, if they survived, hang, hung in the balance. Years of hopelessness and despair. How will they possibly begin to believe that help is on the way? That they can find food and water and shelter. Unless someone is there to tell them, to show them, and to encourage them. And it may take some convincing that they would dare to hope again after all they've been through. And to really believe that this time, this government will get it right after their experience. You know, right now, the United States is involved in conflict in Iraq. From time to time, news reports 
tell us of mistreatment of Iraqi civilians by American troops. We're not there. We don't really know what's going on in these cases. But some officials from the U.S. military admit that every time there is an incident of even perceived misconduct by Americans, it's a step back in winning the hearts and minds of the people because trust is eroded. Well, in tomorrow's world, which we are picturing during these feast days, we'll be a part of a system and an administration that won't make mistakes. That when we tell people that help is on the way and we are there for them, after some time, they will understand and believe it, but it will take some convincing. We will start to restore hope, and that's an all-important quality. Verse 10, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a water garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Notice they're coming out of sorrow. They're coming out of heartache, coming out of difficulties, unspeakable calamities. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. It's a transition period, and we're going to be involved in that turning their sorrow into joy. What a tremendous message of hope and optimism that, is, that we find here in the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 16, Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of enemy, the enemy. And there is hope in your end, says the Lord. God says, and will say to Israel and to the whole world, there is hope in your end. It will work out. And you and I will be the specific ones delivering that message and telling them and lifting them up and helping them on their way as they wake, make their way back to their homeland. Now that's what optimism is about, isn't it? That everything will work out in the end. What an awesome opportunity it is for you and I to be entrusted with this mission. So how important will it be that we, who are the emissaries of God, representatives of His kingdom and government, are filled with hope ourselves and vision and optimism? Not just a Pollyanna, not, not being unrealistic, you know, not Don't Worry, Be Happy. I, I don't think the, the song uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy will be the theme song of the millennium. You know, that came out a number of years ago. Uh, no, there will be real problems, but those real problems will have real solutions, and those solutions will work out. And the positivity and optimism and hope will begin to grow and grow and spread and spread, and others will tell of other, to others what's going on, how things are working out, and it will be a wonderful thing. We find that. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1. And, and we can be a part of that. If we are taking on God's mind right now, if we are learning to have that kind of optimism and excitement and hope, in positivity in our lives now. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen you the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. You notice our job is going to be, especially at the beginning of the millennium, is to strengthen those with a fearful heart. Strengthen those and help those who have gone through this calamity. 
that things are going to work out. Things are changing. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be different this time. That God himself is in charge and they won't believe it at first perhaps. But you and I will be there to coax them, to plead with them, to beseech them, to implore them to follow. And over time, trust will be built. <clears throat> they will see that this government works and can be trusted and is there for their hope. Strengthen the weak hands. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God. With a vengeance, he will come and save you. Verse 12, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Again, who's going to encourage them, brethren? We know the pattern. God works through other people, doesn't he? He works through other beings. The whole substance of the plan is that he will work through people who have yielded themselves to him, who have become the resurrected saints, resurrected God beings in the kingdom, and he will work through them to teach others. So who's going to convey this message to encourage them, to lead them, to comfort them, to talk to them, to tell them everything will be okay? Well, it'll be the representatives of God in Christ because that's their message. That's the message of God. That's how he thinks, <clears throat> that everything is going to be okay. That's the message that he wants to communicate. If you think about it, the Father and Jesus Christ are dealers in hope, aren't they? And they want us to be on their team so we can be dealers in hope as well. Isaiah chapter 52, notice. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. <clears throat> Isaiah 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, Your God reigns. Now, this isn't saying that we will have especially beautiful feet. Uh, what it means is that we, if we are there, if we're faithful, if we qualify, if we finish our race, which God is fully confident that we can do, He has that hope for us, then we will be bringing them good tidings. And it will be a joy that we are coming, that we are walking towards them, that our feet are motivating us to get to them. That will be a blessing for them. Isn't it interesting that the whole message of God's plan is not called the bad news? is not called the everything's falling apart news or the, well, it probably won't work out anyway news. Sometimes we get caught in that kind of a rut humanly, don't we? We start to feel despondent or depressed or discouraged when things don't work out. But God's message is called the good news. What does that say about him? Well, that he's an optimist. It's good news. It's not bad news. Yes, there are warnings. There are calls to repentance, but that's not the only thing that God focuses on. The warnings and the exhortations to repent lead to peace and safety and prosperity. The good news. In the end, everything will work out. That's the point. If we follow him, if we submit to him. Verse 8 Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing. Isn't it interesting that the watchmen, we know the Ezekiel watchmen, the warning, the, the watchman gives the warning. The watchman is the one who cries aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their sins. That's what the watchman does. But notice in this time period when people are coming back after being broken and bruised, what does the watchman do then? It says he will lift up his voice with singing. Be a part of the encouragement of those who need encouragement at the beginning of the, of the millennium. The watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, the watchmen and those that they care for. You waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted His people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. 
The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. We can have a chance and an opportunity to lead in singing praise to God and thankfulness for his deliverance. That is, if you and I continue on our path of walking with God, of learning to be eternal optimists in His way, in His government, in His system, in His church, as He is an eternal optimist. He really is the ultimate eternal optimist, isn't He? Not President Reagan. God and Jesus Christ really are the ultimate eternal optimists. And we are striving to become like them. Notice in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 39. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 39. We find the instruction about the Feast of Tabernacles here. Verse 39 It says, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Verse 40. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You know, when we come to the feast, it's a good time to think about all that has happened in the past year, isn't it? Every year is full of blessings, of successes, big and small, of growing, of overcoming, of developing, of being a part of the work, of creating more of God's character in our character. It's been a good year for all of us, many if not most of us, when we look at God's blessings He's given us. And truly, if we look at the spiritual blessings, even if we have had physical trials, it's been a good year for all of us if we have grown, if we, we have developed, if we've been walking the path that God gives to us. Of course, many of us, if not all of us, have had trials certainly in this year as well. Financial trials, family difficulties, personal pain, uh, even serious health trials or loss of loved ones. And of course, it seems that sometimes... Trials heat up just before the holy day season in the spring and the fall, almost as if Satan is trying to distract us from keeping our focus on something important like the holy days, right? Something exciting, something optimistic, something with hope. He wants us to get our minds off of that. He wants us to get our minds off the plan of God, the hope of mankind, the very source through God's Spirit, of the optimism and vision in our life. And, of course, that is detailed in the holy days. And that's why it's so important that we are here, so we can get refocused. No matter how hard Satan has tried to weigh us down and get at us and confuse us and distract us, even for those of us who can't get to the feast, can't attend the feast for some reasons, health reasons or others, Um, might be watching this at home right now. You know, it's still crucial for you to get focused on the optimistic message of these days, even if you're not at the feast yourself. The feast is a time to rejoice, isn't it? It's a command to rejoice, to look on the positive, to be appreciative for our blessings, for the positive things in our life. It's a command to prepare to spread that message of joy to others in the kingdom. It's a lot about optimism. You know, you think about the, the message of the, the, of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Millennium. There's all kinds of <clears throat> things that are optimistic about it, isn't it? Uh, growth of the economy. Every man sitting under his vine and fig tree. Men and women able to reach their potential without fear of war and violence. All people coming to know God and experience His power and have His mind. Tremendous blessings and growth and hope and optimism in the future and to think that we can have a part in helping them to see that what an amazing thing nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1 nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1 but first we have to become men and women of optimism ourselves don't we 
Again, it's not just being naive or unrealistic or inexperienced. It actually is becoming like God and to think the way He does and to have His hope and to have a real vision of the future and have that burning brightly in us. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Of course, that was the observance of the Feast of Trumpets, which we observed already. Verse 3, And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for that purpose. Verse 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. They said, this isn't a time of mourning. This is a time to celebrate. This is a time to be happy, to eat and drink and fellowship and share time with brethren and invite people over and be invited over. Sounds a lot like the feast, doesn't it? Now, is God against mourning? Is is God against being sad when we're hurt or in pain? Is he saying, just bury your emotions, don't feel them, don't let them out, just squelch them? No, of course not. Actually, the Day of Atonement is a day of mourning and even weeping and crying out to God to clean us up from our sins. There's a time and place for everything. What he's saying is the Feast of Tabernacles is the time to rejoice and celebrate. Verse 10, Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. Now, why do we celebrate? Why are we happy at the Feast of Tabernacles? Is it just because we're eating and drinking? Is it just because we're spending time with each other? Is it just because we are sharing in our blessings? Well, let's read on. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's not just the physical things. We know that. That's no big surprise. But sometimes we can get focused on the physical things at the feast. Why are we celebrating? Why is it a time of happiness and optimism and hope? He says right here, The joy of the Lord is your strength. God is positive. God is joyful. God thinks we can make it and thinks we can have a part in bringing all mankind along as well. And that's what makes us happy. That's what inspires us and gives us hope. That is our strength, our fortress, our defense. and able to fight against discouragement and despair and depression. That's what makes us happy. They're more than just nice-sounding words. This is the source of hope, God Himself. And the more we tap into that source, the more our life will overflow with that vision and hope and optimism, and we can be more of a tool in His hands to help others and convey it to others. Are you discouraged? Are you depressed? You know, some people come to the feast discouraged and down. You might be. You might be undergoing grinding trials even right now or some that you left back home that will be there when you get back home. But if you are, ask God to help you see this vision of the future, to see this meaning of the feast really immerse yourself in the message of the feast because it's incredibly powerful and hopeful for us now and for those who we will help in the future verse 11 he says so the levites stilled all the people saying hold your peace for the day is holy neither be you grieved it's not a time of mourning not a time of sorrow 
And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem saying go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as, as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God. And in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim, and all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths, and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua the son of Nun unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Tremendous feast of tabernacles, very great gladness, pointing towards the ultimate fulfillment and peace and joy and extreme great gladness throughout the world that is yet ahead. Brethren, how important is it that we really take on this attitude of optimism and hope and forward thinking and positivity? After all, we can't have that much effect, can we? Just one person? Well, I think you and I know the answer. Does our attitude, whether it's optimistic or pessimistic, really matter to others and to those that we affect around us in the church of God? Well, we remember the story of Israel coming out of Egypt. Remember when they were just about to go into the promised land. Two and a half or so million people who were excited, who were thrilled about going into this new land that they had heard about that they knew would be a tremendous place to raise their families, to grow, to expand as a nation, to grow in population. You know, their optimism was dissipated by the report of ten men. Ten people dissuaded two and a half million people from entering the land because they said it couldn't be done. They said it wouldn't work. Negativity can have devastating effects. Anticipation and joy can turn to fearfulness, to discouragement, to despair, and even to rebellion. Amazing. Negativity is not something that pleases God. Brethren, how much power will be in our hands when we are given authority over cities to affect how people think, to affect how they think about their life, their goals, their obstacles, their future? When ten men were able to turn the minds of millions of people, how much power is in our hands right now, in our life, in our effect on others simply because of the attitude we choose. Attitude has power. Negative attitudes have power, but so does optimism, especially when motivated and driven by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The word optimism, defined by Merriam Webster Online Dictionary, uh, says it comes from the French optimisme, from the Latin optimum, which means best. Optimism simply comes from a word meaning the best. In other words, that the, the things will work out for the best, that God has our best interest at heart. He will accomplish what's best for us. That's ultimately what optimism means. But there's more to the definition. The interesting thing about the Latin word optimum, it is also related to the word ops, O-P-S, which means power. Power. It has to do with best and power. Interesting. There is corrosive power in cynicism and negativity, but there is also uplifting and edifying power in optimism and contagious power. You know, people are drawn to an optimistic leader. They were drawn to President Reagan. 
in his eulogies and, and in the memorials, um, different individuals said wh whether they liked his policies or not, whichever side of the aisle they were on in the political scene, all conceded that he had communicated a vision and elevated the spirit of America, even though his themes and his vision to some seemed archaic and hokey and laughable, at least at first. Even in this carnal and secular world, our society, people are drawn to a leader who deals in hope, who believes there is a positive vision of how life can be better. And yet, our political leaders, they can't really deliver that. They can be convicted of it themselves, and they can draw people there. There is power there, but they can't do it by themselves. But you and I will have the chance, not by our own will, but by God's power, His Spirit, and through the very good news of God, giving us the power to overcome ourselves and help others to see what He has in store for them. Again, brethren, how much can that be accomplished now and in the future if we tap into it? Is that not why we're here? to foretell of that time and to prepare for it now. Perfect time now that we're observing the Feast of Tabernacles to think about it, prepare for it, uh, make some goals, think about our life, think about our attitudes, our character, how we can grow in optimism, real optimism, both for ourselves and those we serve. In the time remaining, let's talk about some strategies we can use to grow in this direction. We are an optimistic people. We are positive. There is energy and excitement in the church of God. You can feel it, but we can always grow, and we need to nurture that and increase it and plan for making it even to grow even more. How do we do that? Well, even while we're here at the feast, number one, focus on the gospel. Focus on the gospel. The work is why we're here at this time. The work is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, which will be set up on the earth. And that message is why we're sitting here right now. We're actually walking through the good news of the gospel as we gather all over the world. And the more we think about that and ponder it and focus on it and pray about it, the more it will really affect our thinking even while we're here at the feast. You know, the little inconveniences... Uh, our mate not hanging the towel upright or not squeezing the toothpaste outright or the little things that bug each other while we're at the feast, they don't seem all that important when we really think about the big picture, right? The good news, why we're here, that we're walking through the great plan of God. Not only is it good news for us, for, for those who are coming in the future. It can ha affect our thinking if we're focused on it even while we're here. Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. That can even remind us why we're here. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's literally going to happen in the future. We know that. People who are bound in captivity, coming back to a good land, someone reaching down to hold their hand and help them up along the way. And that someone can be you and me. What an amazing thing. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. That's part of the work to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that it, he might be glorified. Brethren, are you filled with the oil of joy? That's what the spirit is called, the oil of joy. Do you need more of that? Ask God for it. Jesus Christ came to bring it, the Holy Spirit. It was given after his death and resurrection and being raised to the Father, of course, on the day of Pentecost, on 30, 31 A.D., it was given. <clears throat> we learned about that at Pentecost. Do you need the oil of joy? Do you need to ask God for the oil of joy? Right now in your life, are there trials that are wearing you down? Verse 4, And they 
shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth her bud and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. A brand new beginning for all nations on earth. What? An amazing thing. Not just joy and celebration and happiness for them, but also even a continuing work that they will then be a part of. We all will be dealers in hope. <clears throat> you know, the more we are involved in the growth of others, the more joy we experience, don't we? You know, during the feast, ever think about it? While we are at the feast, the telecast keeps going on the air. The magazines keep arriving in people's mailboxes. People keep responding to the good news. People keep having their eyes open and their minds open, enlightened to the truth. People keep being called by God to repentance while we're here at the feast. The work continues on. Thinking about it can encourage us, can help us and remind us why we're here. Another strategy to prepare for being positive ambassadors of God in His kingdom is to pray and study. It's very simple, very basic, but you know, sometimes while we're here at the feast, we need to remind ourselves that we need to pray about the work. We need to keep our mind on what God is doing around the world, not just get so focused on the activities and the fun things we're doing here and forget the whole purpose of why we're here. It's not just a vacation. It's not just having fun. Uh, we are here to become more like God. We're here to train to be like Him. We're here to be ready so we can be entrusted with teaching and guiding people in the millennium to be dealers of hope in a new society. You know, to do that, we have to be in regular contact with Him, don't we? Even while we're here. We know we may not get as much Bible study and prayer and during the feast as we would like, but we should get some. After all, that's our lifeline to a positive attitude. How could we possibly expect to have a positive outlook if we don't connect to the source of joy and fulfillment in our lives? Really, if you think about it, why would we come all the way to the feast and then cut ourselves off from the connection to the joy and hope and optimism in our lives? That's God. Why would we come all the way here to observe for eight days the, the coming millennium and the plan of God and what's coming after and then cut ourselves off from Him while we're here? It doesn't make any sense, right? And yet how easy it is to get busy and you know, everything happens so fast and we all get going. If we're not careful, our time can slip by and we haven't even spent time with God, though we've spent time with one another. We need to make time with God. God as well as each other. First John chapter one and verse three. First John chapter one and verse three says, That which we have seen and heard we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You notice that fellowship with God produces joy and optimism and hope and a vision of the future. What's the real source of joy at the feast? It's not the food. It's not our accommodations. It's not even our fellowship with each other, although that is certainly a part of it. It's really our fellowship with God, and the other things spring from that. Having a little more of his mind, a little more clear vision of what he has for us, a little bit stronger in our defense against discouragement and depression and despair because remember that that defense is the joy of the lord that's our strength verse 5 this this then is the message which we have heard of him the good news in other words and declare unto you that god is light and in 
Him is no darkness at all. God isn't gloomy about the future. Verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son cleanses us from all sin. You know, we make a lot of plans at the feast, and that's great. <clears throat> we make plans to uh, eat out, to, to get together, to share, to invite people over, and we spend a lot of time with each other. Are we remembering to make plans with God? If we're making plans with our friends and and those we love and our brethren, are we making time with God at the feast? Well, that is our ultimate source of hope and optimism and joy. What about when things go wrong, as they are bound to from time to time? Could that happen at this feast? Well, it does since we're human. It uh, Most of the time, something goes wrong during the feast. Well, how do we respond to it? That brings us to the next point, number three. Give others a good feast. Give others a good feast. When we're focused on ourselves, we often can get kind of down, can't we? And one of the quickest and easiest ways to be positive is focusing on serving others. Notice Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, we know that the antidote, one of the ways of getting out of discouragement and being down is to get our minds off ourselves and think about the needs of others. Well, how much more at the feast? You know, if we are just trying to get a good feast, we will be sorely disappointed. But if we get our minds off ourselves and focus on the needs of others, especially when things go wrong, We're going to be a lot happier. We'll be following in the footsteps of Christ who set that example and we'll be striving to have his mind. How are you going to serve at the feast? How are you serving this year at the feast? There are a thousand different ways that we can serve at the feast. The crews that need volunteers, uh, our fellowship can be a chance to serve, a way of serving one another. Uh, Even a smile, a friendly hello, uh, going up to those that we don't know. That can be serving. Young and old, if we see someone that doesn't have anyone to talk to, let's go up to them, introduce ourselves, ask them where they're from. It's amazing when we start thinking about others, how others must be feeling that we forget that we're nervous or uncomfortable or shy. It's a matter of thinking on the things of others and not just ourselves. And that really becomes training our minds to work in the way that they will in the future and not just be thinking about our own things. Number four, number four, another thing that we can do to increase our positivity and prepare for being eternal optimists, number four is solve problems constructively. Solve problems constructively. It's inevitable that some things will go wrong. Uh, Perhaps some things have already gone wrong already in this feast. What do we do? Well, we don't lie and say that nothing's gone wrong when it has But we seek to solve the problems constructively. You know, especially towards the end of the feast, as we get a little tired, we're living in close proximity uh, with one another. We can even get a little impatient with one another. What should we do? Well, we need to first get our sleep. You know, it's hard to be positive when we're tired. General Patton said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. It doesn't do any good to be staying up late every night during the feast if we can't stay awake during the sermon the next day or if we're getting grouchy the next morning, right? That's one way to head problems off before they happen. So we need to get our rest. One minister years ago in in, uh, our former association sang this song at the feast during a a sermon, and uh, I'll sing it to you. He says, 
You can't be a grump at the Feast of Tabernacles. You can't be a grump at the Feast of Tabernacles. No, you can't be a grump at the Feast of Tabernacles. But you can be happy if you want to. <clears throat> I won't sing it again. You get the gist. Uh, what happens if we, despite our best efforts, we have conflict? You know, ultimately, it is up to our decision to be happy at the feast. We do have the power to be positive. We do have the power to forgive one another if something goes wrong. It's called forgiveness. It's called looking on the bright side. It's called being positive. It's called being optimistic. It's called giving each other some slack, as we say. Notice in Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. Are you making the choice this year to be positive, to have a happy feast, to be optimistic? Luke 23, verse 33, it says, When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, Jesus Christ, and the malefactors on the right hand and on the other, on the left. Then said Jesus, notice this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the midst of a horrible trial, the torment, the beatings, the torture, the humiliation, do you, have you, do you see that Christ did not allow himself to be given into a negative frame of mind, even under the most awful circumstances? He pitied those hurting him. He felt sorry for them, and he urged God to be merciful. What an incredible attitude. Now, how does that compare with the little things that happen at the feast? Can we forgive one another when little inconveniences happen? Well, we can. We can consciously choose to forgive one another, even if they've hurt us even if they've offended us, even when harsh words are spoken sometimes, even when something inconsiderate is done. A key to success in solving problems at the feast is simply choosing to forgive. You know, forgiveness is a way to be optimistic. It, it, it really even, by definition, includes the fact that we are optimistic about that person making it too that we're not holding what they did to us against them. We see they have value. We see they will be in God's kingdom. We see they have potential. We see they are growing. You know, we need to make consciously the effort and choice to forgive whether people apologize or not. That's exercising tremendous optimism. It is a first step towards solving our problems. <clears throat> Parents, give your gift the gift of optimism in solving problems. You know, that's what we're training for, to spread optimism to others. I know what it's like to grow up in the church and not being able to play sports on Friday nights, uh, games on the Sabbath, you know, but I will always be grateful that my parents helped us to see beyond that game or that season or that school year to what God was offering us or moving in the ministry. Growing up in the church, our family moved around from time to time. But I will always be grateful that they taught us, our parents, by their example to look at these things as opportunities, not as obstacles and adventures and new places to go and new people to meet. Yes, it was hard. Yes, there were difficulties involved. But it's a priceless gift when we teach our children to be optimistic, be realistic, but optimistic as well. You know, we're going to be teaching our children, so to speak, those that we work with in the kingdom, in the millennium. And in a sense, they will be like our children. We will watch them. We will feel for them. We'll sorrow with them. We'll grow close to them. We'll be happy at their successes we'll really be teaching them like our children. And isn't that what we will be doing? Helping them to overcome their problems, helping them to forgive one another, helping them to be positive, even in trials. James chapter 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> James chapter 1 and verse 1. 
but we need to ask God for this mindset. It doesn't come naturally. His spirit, the oil of joy, the strength. Remember, he is, this, he is the strength of our joy. The joy of the Lord he is our strength. James said in James chapter 1 and verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. How can we possibly rejoice when we have trials? You know, this scripture is really kind of befuddling if you look at it just from a carnal point of view. But you know, the more you walk this way of life, the more we understand it, don't we? He's talking about we can, even in trials, if we understand what God is accomplishing, we understand the character He's building, we understand that the whole plan is guiding us to bring us where He wants us to be. Yes, we can be hopeful and positive and optimistic even in trials. We can be cheerful. We can have hopeful endurance, which is what the word means, even in trials. Why are we here? Well, because we are training to see the future as God sees the future. So we can instill hope and power and optimism in the people of the future. We're not there yet. We still get down. We still get depressed. We still have trials. We still get tired. We even get annoyed with one another from time to time. But we need what we are going to get here, what we are already getting here. That is a vision of the future, of the hope and the purpose and the positivity, the good news of the coming intervention of God on earth and the tremendous change in society that will come about and how we will be a part of it and what we need to do now to prepare for that. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, that's the same word as in James. We are told by God, others have gone before. There is a whole cloud of witnesses that have run this race before us and that are running this race with us. And we've got to see the future and we've got to be hopeful if we are expecting to finish that race. And God can give us the power and God can give us the strength and He can give us the mindset to be able to do that. Let's rejoice, brethren. Let's leave our problems behind. Let's look beyond our trials. That's why we're here, to get the big picture. We're going to get more and more of that as we keep this feast, as we keep other feasts in the future, to lay aside the weight and the doubt and the fear that drags us down and run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was because of the joy that Jesus Christ had, the hope, the faith, the optimism in the plan of God that enabled him to finish his course, enabled him to run his race with patience, that in the end everything would work out because God had said it would and the plan had set it in motion not just for him but for all of us verse 3 for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds God has not called us to fail and I think at the Feast of Tabernacles it's a good time to remind ourselves of that he hasn't called us to discouragement he hasn't called us to be filled with doubt and fear he's called us to be filled with his mind his thoughts his viewpoint his vision empowered by his spirit the oil of joy so we can then impart that vision to others as pictured by these days in conclusion president reagan former president reagan again served his time lifted a nation, 
and really left an enduring mark on this country as a hopeful visionary. At the time of his death, Mr. D. Partian wrote this in the headquarters update, and I'd like to read it to you. This is from June 17, 2004. He said, Why did Mr. Ronald Reagan's death so strongly affect the Americans and most of the world? After all, he was 93 years old, tragically incapacitated by Alzheimer's disease for the last 10 years. Nonetheless, practically every day last week, the American media devoted much time to Mr. Reagan reviewing his political career as a twice-elected American president and commenting particularly on his family life, on his way of coping with circumstances, and on his personality. But besides being a great president, what made Mr. Reagan so popular and respected? The press was almost unanimous. His personality and character, his ability to communicate with people, his optimism and humor, his faith and hope in God. Mr. Reagan had a mission to accomplish. He did it by using these tools. We, too, in God's church are called for a mission, Mr. Partian goes on to say. Similarly, we, too, are in need of these tools to accomplish our mission. Time magazine called Mr. Reagan a man for his times and the eternal optimist. Last Friday, as I watched the live telecast of Mr. Reagan's funeral services, I reflected upon these thoughts and said to myself, how much more every one of us in God's church could accomplish if we lived and worked with more humor, more optimism, more joy, more faith, more hope. Brethren, that's exactly the point. We need optimism, joy, and faith, and hope. We know the source, and that's why we're here. Walking through the positive, powerful plan of God, asking God to infuse us with his optimism so we can become eternal optimists and we can help it encourage others with the hope that lies in the years just ahead.